Um, I'm a Marine Corps veteran of Afghanistan. You can see a little picture of me there. That's about, I don't know what, 15 years ago, two kids. And, 20 pounds ago, so that was, that was a ways ago, but um, I've also been uh, with DAV and a life member of DAV for about 10 years. Very, very glad to be part of this organization. I love what we do for veterans every single day. Um, and I am very lucky to be following in Joy's footsteps. Oftentimes it feels like I am running at breakneck speed to catch up with Joy because she's just so knowledgeable. She's been doing this for so long, and I'm very lucky to be learning from her. Um, and for those of you who had a chance to hear the Secretary's remarks the other day. Joy truly is, as he said, a quiet giant. Um, she's been doing this for so long and been doing a great job for women veterans. I'd also like to uh, give a quick shout out to DAV's Interim Women Veterans Committee. I know some of you are here, hopefully all of you are here. Uh, Jenny Hansen, Amy Ball, Belinda Hill, and Darren Greer, you guys help to rate my ship sometimes and give me some good feedback on what I need to be doing for women veterans, so thank you all for what you do. So, if you were in the Benefits Protection Team seminar the other day, um, I went through a number of the women veterans bills that are currently, um, that have been introduced or reintroduced during the 117th Congress. This is a list of women veterans legislation that we do support. Um, I'm not going to go through the entire list because I said we just have so much to get through today. Um, but if you are interested in learning more about any of these specific bills, and, and there's some great ones with provisions concerning maternity care, uh, support for MST survivors, uh, advancing mammography services, early detection screenings for breast cancer, uh, fertility services, and more, um, go ahead and check out dav.org slash bptl2021 and you can go right to that link and, and check out the, the women veterans portion and get a deeper look at that legislation. On that note though, I'm going to give a little plug to the DAV can here and I'm going to show you exactly how quick and easy it is for those of you who may not already be familiar with DAV can to go ahead and support legislation for this. So go ahead and take a look. On the left hand side of the screen, I'm going to show you just how fast and easy this is. So, pull out your mobile phone, type in dabcam.org right into the browser. You're going to go ahead and when that loads up, click on the menu under Take Action to view all of our current campaigns. You can scroll on through and pick the one that you'd like to throw your support behind. Review the uh, pre drafted letter to your representatives, or you can go ahead and, and write some of your own text. Click Submit. And there you go, in about 23 seconds, you have taken action on legislation that supports women veterans. What's that? Oh, how about I can show you right afterwards. We will whip out the phone. We can support some women veterans legislation together. But this will all be on uh, the site as well. You can always review this slide. All of these presentations will be available for you on the back end. Yep, and from there, I know this is gonna play over and over again until I stop talking. Um, from there, once you're finished with that, once you've actually submitted the letter to your representatives, you can also click to share it on any of your social media platforms. So not only you, but your friends and relatives back home, they can also support the legislation. One of the pieces of legislation I do want to go ahead and highlight, just because I think it's going to be important and relevant to the conversation with our guests later on, is the Deborah Sampson Act. Um, this comprehensive piece of legislation was passed into law as part of the Johnny Isaacson and David P. Rowe MD Veterans Health Care and Benefits Improvement Act uh, it was passed late last year and signed into law earlier this year. It includes provisions, a number of which came directly from DAV's uh, Women Veterans Reports and Recommendations uh, for both VA health care and the benefits side that pertain to women veterans. This includes things like updates and improvements to health care spaces for women as well as environmental care standards, um, enhancing staff cultural camp competency through training, funding, and the addition of women veterans or women uh, peer support specialists for women veterans. Elimination of sexual assault and harassment. Uh, improvements to military sexual trauma case claims processing, including evaluation of service connection for mental health conditions that are related to MST, uh, and choice of sex for VA medical examiners for CMP exams. And as well as improved data collection uh, broken down by gender, race, ethnicity, um, as well as research on barriers to actually accessing health care through VA. So I'm going to go ahead and just get this moving. Um, 
talk a little bit about the lineup of our guests. We do have a, a great video between uh, Joy and Representative Julia Brown, who's the uh, chair, chairwoman of the Congressional Women Veterans Task Force. She was kind enough to share some time with us the other day, um, and they had a great conversation. Ms. Leela Jackson, to my right, uh, the director of the Assault and Harassment Prevention Office at VHA, also a Marine Corps veteran. On the far side, to my left here, Ms. Cheryl Rawls, Executive Director for Outreach, Transition, and Development at VBA, and an Army veteran. Here to my left, Mr. Stephen Raw, uh, Stephen Ellis. <laughs> Mr. Stephen Ellis, the uh, Senior Customer Experience Strategist with VBA. Um, Representative Brownlee wanted to be here with us today. In person, we did invite her. Um, unfortunately, she had to be back in her district this week, but she did, as I mentioned, give a, a great interview with Joy the other day talking about uh, an update on the Women Veterans Task Force as well as some current legislation. So we'll go ahead and get that kicked off here. Chairwoman Brownlee, thank you for taking time to participate in the Women Veterans Seminar as part of DAB's 2021 National Convention. As you know, DAB has been at the forefront of ensuring our nation's women veterans have access to programs and health services to meet their gender-specific needs. And of course, it's always an honor and a pleasure to have you, as a leader on this issue, join us to discuss key legislative issues and to provide an update on the work of the Congressional Women Veterans Task Force that you chair. Well, thanks, Joy. And the first thing that I want to say is how much I enjoy working with you, and I want all of your members to know uh, what an exceptional advocate uh, you are for your membership, and particularly um, you are women veterans, our women veterans, and so I just want to thank you for that, and I look forward to our uh, continued uh, relationship. And as you said, we had great success in the 116th Congress. And uh, in that first hearing that I had, I probably should have named the hearing Deborah Sampson and Beyond as opposed to Beyond Deborah Sampson because one of the very first priorities uh, for this year will be to make sure uh, that the entirety of Deborah Sampson um, is initiated and, and, and uh, that the VA fulfills its obligations. And then there are other things that we actually discussed in the last Congress that we felt like we couldn't put uh, in the Deborah Sampson bill. We have new issues uh, that we're dealing with in the 117th Congress, but some of the more obvious ones are uh, equal access to contraception. Uh, as you know, uh, uh, female veterans have to make a copay when they buy when they procure their contraceptions. Uh, civilian women don't have to do that through the ACA, and the women serving in the military don't have to pay, but don't need to make a copay. So we want to get that done. That passed uh, uh, through the House and is over on the Senate side, and we hope to really uh, get that done right away. Obviously, uh, IVF and fertility, we can talk about all of these uh, uh, bills. Congresswoman Underwood has a um, a very important bill on uh, morbidity. Homeless veterans, uh, particularly focused on women. Families is, part of, is the fastest growing homeless population um, in, in our country right now, and so we need to do more to keep families together when they need homeless, homeless shelters. Uh, another bill that I hope, you know, again, uh, through the task force we can get um, passed, and that is, we know that women who served in the military between 1951 and 1976, if they became pregnant, they had to leave, they were forced to leave the military. So we've put forward a bill to say, first of all, we don't know how many women are impacted. Uh, second of all, we don't know how they were discharged. And third of all, we want to determine all of that uh, and re-up their benefits uh, within the VA and to correct uh, a, a wrong. But those are some of the things that uh, uh, we're working on, and I'm sure um, as the Women's Veterans Task Force gets underway, uh, we will be working uh, on, a, on, a lot more, on a lot more issues. Um, one of the issues you just mentioned, infertility issues, um, is HR 1957, the Veterans Infertility Treatment Act, 
which DNA supports, and that that's built in hands and that that's for veterans to in fertility care. And we have a lot of concerns over the impacts of toxic exposures and other risks that are inherent in military service on reproductive health. In addition, you know, so many um, veterans struggle with infertility without ever understanding why. So what is your sense of this legislation moving forward, given the support that we've seen in the issues in recent months? Well, uh, thank you for that, and uh, I, I think uh, my uh, IVF bill, um, uh, one very important point about the IVF bill is I want to make infertility and resolving of infertility part of a woman's whole health. And what we have learned and what we know, particularly for women, it is very, very difficult to discern and determine um, the, uh, if it's service connected or not. So it should be just part of the overall health services uh, provided to the VA. A woman who has served our country uh, and has put her life on the line for our country should have the access to all health care, and I think infertility is, is, is part of that. Another issue um, I know that's probably on our members' minds is the Department of Defense recently released their uh, findings of the Independent Review Commission looking into sexual assaults in the military. And we were very pleased early on, um, as soon as uh, the Defense Secretary, Secretary Lloyd Austin, was um, uh, confirmed, along with VA Secretary McDonough, they both made commitments to making serious changes based on the commission's recommendations, um, this, inter this internal um, independent review. So from your seat in Congress and, and overseeing the implementation of these provisions, how would you uh, rate VA so far? How, how the effort is going? And what do you think, um, you know, Secretary McDonough should really prioritize in be working on immediately to make sure that they can achieve the creation of a cultural change that's really long overdue and, and very yeah. Well, yeah, well, thank you for that question. And it's it's uh, really an important one. Um, and I really do uh, applaud uh, Defense Secretary Austin for making the statements that he uh, has made and said that he wants to take this issue out of the chain of command that the time is now. And in terms of this sort of epidemic uh, of sexual harassment and assault in the military, just as you said, bleeds right over um, into the culture uh, of the VA. And um, it is imperative that we have a zero tolerance on that. And it's got to start, it has got to start in the military. I can tell you that Secretary McDonough, in terms of uh, sexual harassment and assault, uh, it is a key priority for him. He is, has assured me that he, this is one of his very first priorities and really wants to uh, institute uh, these rules and regulations that are directed uh, through Deborah Sampson uh, into the VA. It's just intolerable that a woman who perhaps is experiencing military sexual trauma goes to a VA to get help and support and finds herself being harassed at the VA herself. We have to have policies within the VA that addresses this and reporting mechanisms. Chair Wendell Bradley, thank you for taking time to participate in the one. Damson uh, into the VA. It's just intolerable that a woman who perhaps is experiencing military sexual trauma goes to a VA to get help and support and finds herself being harassed at the VA herself. We have to have policies within the VA that addresses this and reporting mechanisms um, and making clear that this environment is a zero tolerant environment, period, dead stop. Um, and I think uh, our secretary, Secretary McDonough, is all in uh, on that notion. 
I'm now focusing on a lot of the latest generation of women veterans. You know, they tend to have some really unique um, needs that VA hasn't encountered before. We have had a lot of younger women veterans. So things like maternity care, coordination, care for amputations and other more related injuries, and post-deployment mental health challenges and the difference between um, how genders, uh, you know, experience their military um, experience and how they process that and then their transition and what makes a successful transition. But I also just want to ask you about your thoughts on, um, you know, VA has a large contingent of older women veterans like myself uh, who use the VA and we have different care needs than our younger uh, service, you know, younger women veterans. So from what you've seen, do you feel VA is prepared to address the needs not only just of our newest generation of women veterans, but also our older women veterans population? I appreciate you bringing that question uh, to me today because I I don't think that uh, they are prepared for our older generation uh, within the our, our veteran community. Um, I typically refer to it as the silver tsunami that's coming through, um, and so we have a big bubble of more senior you know veterans uh, uh, coming through the system. Um, and we really need to be ready to um, uh, support them uh, in, their, in their needs and to be able to have a quality of life towards the end of their life. Veterans want to stay home if they can stay home. And they want to stay there as long as they possibly can. Sometimes that's just not possible. Uh, but if we can provide the supports that they need, um, and the services they need to be able to stay at home, that's what I want to accomplish. And I believe it's win-win because I think it, we will better serve veterans, they will, they will be more satisfied with that service, and I think it will cost less where we can uh, re-engineer those resources into the other programs that uh, our, our senior veterans need. And I think we all know, uh, in general, women usually live longer, and so, yes. uh, you know, we're more apt to need those types of services. So again, we're grateful that that's going to be on, on your radar uh, coming up. And I just want to give you a sort of a final question. You know, what's, what's next on the horizon for Women's Women's Task Force? What are the priority issues you'll stay zeroed in on? Yeah, well, I think we've talked a lot about some of the, you know, sort of legislative, uh, you know, direction uh, that we want to go in, um, and I'm sh I am very, very anxious to get back to a pre-COVID uh, environment again, where we can begin to, uh, you know, the, do the traveling and uh, and have women veterans come back to Washington D.C. and to have those. Uh, hearings and roundtables that we that we had up until uh, COVID because those were absolutely uh, you know invaluable. I know that there are many issues out there that we probably have not yet uncovered. So any of your members who are listening right now that have a good legislative idea, pass it on to Joy, and Joy will pass it along to me because we want we are all ears uh, in terms of. Of what we need to be doing and what we should be doing. Uh, every hearing that we had or every roundtable that we had, I, I tried to end every single one of those meetings with this. And that is, uh, you know, to our women veterans, we hear you, we see you, and we thank you for your service because we know, we knew we, before the task force uh, came to be that women did not feel heard, they did not feel seen, and they rarely get thanked for their service. So um, I just want to be, I want to thank all of you out there. I want to thank you for your activism, and uh, let's let's keep working. Exactly. Again, thank you for being here. And uh, we're all behind you, and uh, we will Cheers working with you in the year ahead. Thanks, Joy. Thanks, DAB. Thank you. So, again, thanks to Joy and thanks to Representative Brownlee for their time. Uh, 
giving us that. Need to reset my uh, settings here. Here we go. All right. Um, and now I'm going to go ahead and invite our uh, next guest up um, for a few brief introductory remarks, and then she and I will do a little back and forth Q and A. Uh, now, as the director for the uh, Assault and Harassment Prevention Office, Ms. Leela Jackson has been hard at work tackling culture change at VA, which is huge, albeit critical, um, undertaking. And I have had the pleasure of getting to know Leela over the last few months, and I, I greatly appreciate her candor and her passion um, and her sincere desire to work in a collaborative fashion with VSOs, with DAV, and to really bring our feedback to the table in the development of the outreach materials that they are working on um, to accomplish this incredibly important mission uh, of eliminating sexual assault and harassment at the VA. So I'll now go ahead and invite you up for just a few remarks, and then again, we'll sit down and I'll, I'll pick her brain with some of the questions that I have concerning her mission. Yeah. Hi everyone, thank you so much DAV for inviting me to participate today. It is an honor to be here. Uh, I am a Marine veteran, so I feel like I'm at home being around DAV. Uh, I have worked at the VA for since 2006, um, but I did serve 20 years in the Marine Corps. Um, so this, is, this work is personal to me. I take it very seriously. I'm honored to be leading this work for Veterans Health Administration. Um, I am the director of this new office. The office is probably a year old. It was established right before uh, COVID. Um, under I was away in a White House leadership program, and I came back, and uh, at the time, Dr. Stone was the undersecretary, and he asked me, what do you want to do? You just got back from the White House, a year of fellowship with the White House. What do you want to do? And I said, well, I really want to work on something that's important to this administration and that's impactful for veterans. He says, well, I got the thing for you. I need you to help me with ending harassment and sexual assault in Veterans Health Administration. And that sounds like it might be easy, but it's not. So I'm excited to have the challenge of doing something so important. And I'm really honored to be here today and uh, very thankful to DAV for being so generous with working with uh, VA, has always worked with VA, but especially with me, because I work at VA, I work in DC. So it's nice to be able to be in touch with what veterans really want, to hear firsthand what veterans are saying. And Ashley and Joy and DAV has, has done that for me, so I'm, I and we continue to collaborate, as you'll hear um, today. Welcoming, more safe, more respectful. 
Are you experiencing harassment in our facilities? And we heard a number of things. One of the things that we heard from a, quite a few men was, I didn't even realize that was offensive. I didn't know, I thought it was a compliment. And so sometimes it's really about educating people. Um, sometimes, as you heard the representative say, you know, on active duty, if you get away with it, then you feel like you can get away with it, you know, more freely when you go to VA. And what we're trying to say is that everyone should be able to walk into a VA medical center, any VA facility really, and, it, and be treated with dignity and respect. That's just should be, we should not even have to have this conversation. And so that's really what I'm trying to do, trying to educate folks, uh, trying to change the culture so we don't have 76% of women saying that they've experienced harassment or a sexual assault. We don't want a sexual assault is too many. Um, and we really want people to say something. If you see something, we really want you to say something. So I have a lot on my plate. I want to, you know, we're trying to improve our policies. We're trying to improve our processes. We are definitely implementing Deborah Sampson Act this year. And it's not just Veterans Health Administration. This is a department-wide effort. I'm working with Cheryl Rawls and uh, VBA. It's, you know, it's a collective effort across the department. Yeah, and so you mentioned, obviously, training. And you see something, say something. That's something that, We've all been through that training in the military, right? We've all heard that. And that brings me to my next question. Um, I know that you are working on formulating, developing bystander intervention training for the veteran population. I know it's already been implemented um, for employees in VA, which is great. And, you know, I, I loved, I saw some information in the Center of Research Study talking about looking at people before they did the training and after they did the training. And the numbers were, were shocking. It was so interesting to see how many people could even recognize that these things were an issue after taking the training versus how they felt about it beforehand. So just implementing the training alone, it brings awareness to the fact that there is an issue. It helps people to recognize it. So can you tell us a little bit more about what bystander training is, what it's going to look like for veterans, and, and you know, what's the timing, what's the content going to look like? Okay. So just for those who might not be familiar with bystander intervention training, really it's just a way, it's a tool to empower people to know what to do if you see something. Um, and I think that's probably the number one reason why people don't say anything, because you're not quite sure what to say or what to do or how to respond, so you just decide to just go the other way and don't say anything at all. You don't want to say the wrong thing or you don't want to upset people or, so you just feel, you know, harmful just not doing anything at all. And so the Boston Intervention and Training uh, equips uh, persons to respond appropriately to uh, harassment or sexual assault. Uh, we like to use the four Ds. Uh, D, 1D is direct. If you feel comfortable to say something directly to that person, you know, excuse me, that's not appropriate. You know the person and you say something to the person, that's direct. So you actually want to write to that person. A lot of us don't feel comfortable doing that. Some of us, you know, we don't know them, we don't know what state that person's mind is in, you know, we don't want to engage with that person. We might want to delegate, and delegate is okay. Delegate is calling, them, you know, talking to the VA police, telling your manager, telling someone else, you know, delegating is, you know, taking it off you to give it to someone else to help you diffuse the situation. Uh, distract is, is taking the, you know, taking the conversation away. So you, you are there and you see uh, someone being harassed. So you could say, you could walk up to the person and say, do you have the directions to the pharmacy? I'm trying to figure out how to get to the pharmacy. You just, what you just did was you distracted the whole conversation. You've given that experience, or we're using the word experience or instead of victim. Uh, we're saying that person who's experienced in the branch, now you're giving them a way of escape so they can get away from that uncomfortable situation. And then the other D is document. You might not want to do anything. You might feel like, I don't feel really equipped to do anything, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to write down what I'm saying, and I'm going to hand it over to a VA employee so they can take care of this, because this should not be happening at any VA. Because if you think about it, if you go to Hopkins or to your local hospital in Wisconsin or wherever, do you see a lot of harassment taking place? I mean, do you even expect it? You shouldn't expect it in our, I'm not used to Wisconsin because I have the opportunity to be so wonderful Wisconsin veterans today, but any VA, when I'm in D.C. or when I'm in uh, Hopkins in Baltimore, I've never experienced any harassment. We should not experience it in our VA hospitals. So our training, I'm, I'm thrilled to say that I did get to work with Ashley. She helped, she gave us some feedback on the Boston Intervention training that we're developing 
for veterans. We have 16 million veterans receiving a VA benefit in the country, so that's a lot of veterans. We have 9 million veterans uh, receiving VA health care, so we want to reach the masses. What we have done is develop, we're in the process of finalizing uh, online process and prevention training. So you'll be able to go online and take the training as, as at your own, you know, your own pace. We're also going to be putting out information, written information about, the, you know, my different intervention uh, techniques in case you're not, you know, you don't want to go online and take the training. Uh, we are putting the final touches on the training, so we hope to have it rolled out in September. So we're almost there. Fantastic. Yeah, I, I'm happy to say what I have seen looks great. I think it, it really touches on a number of areas where it is just about ensuring that we're reinforcing that respect element. Would you, you know, want someone to step up for you? If you were in that instance, and I think the answer is resoundingly yes. yes. Yeah. Yep. So, you know, be present of mind if you're there, you're in that situation. You can collect your thoughts, I'm sure you're reading the situation and responding in the appropriate way. So I look forward to seeing that. Um, so part of the Deborah Sampson Act, I know we're talking about outreach and training and, and um, looking at how we're conducting that outreach with veterans. Um, there's a, a working group that's being established. And I was curious if you could give us an update on um, where the, the staff of the working group is um, in that effort to end harassment and assault. What will they be focusing on in the coming months and, and sort of where that's at right now? Okay, um, you're right. The Deborah Sampson Act does call for a working group that consists of members from uh, veteran service organizations, tribal leaders, uh, state and veteran, uh, state and local veterans affairs uh, entities uh, because you know, we need the veteran voice, real frankly. I think Congress figured it out, you know, for us, but we really need it. It makes us, it holds us accountable, holds the VA accountable to doing it. Um, as you heard um, uh, Representative Brownlee say, Secretary McDonough is very serious about ending harassment and sexual assault. He has made that clear and every time I've heard him actually speak, he's talked about it. It's a big deal. He, in April, Secretary McDonough took the White Women VA pledge with 700 leaders across the country, virtually 700 leaders across the country, including our VSO leaders. So he's very serious about it. Um, so he has he has actually established a larger work group that's this uh, harassment prevent, harassment sexual assault prevention and recourse work group, very large work group, and integrated into that work group will be the VSOs, tribal leaders, and other uh, veteran service organizations, and they'll be helping us figure out how do we get down to local level ending harassment, ending sexual assault. We'll be able to hear directly from VSO leaders helping us get to the root of ending it and sustaining the, you know, the, the eradication of harassment, sexual assault in our facilities. Um, they will also help us with how do we get the word out? You know, our biggest challenge is really getting the word out to the veterans who's not at these conventions. Those veterans who are walking to the medical center just, you know, day to day, and they see someone and they, you know, make a remark or they touch them inappropriately. And also, it's getting to those two million veterans, women veterans who are in our country, getting our services, letting them know that we want them to come to VA and get their care and keep getting their care at VA. Not to feel that they're going to be harassed or sexually assaulted when they walk into our facilities. I will say, though, that one harassment, one assault is too many. And we, you know, we hear from a lot of women veterans, they don't experience that, you know. And we also hear from male veterans, male veterans they don't experience. But what we do know in the United States, the Center, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention says that one in four women experience some type of sexual violence in their lifetime. One in ten men experience some type of sexual violence in their lifetime. So that means that it's happening. And it can, it's in our community. So it may have not happened in your unit, but it's happening in your community. And we're saying it's got to stop at the door before you go into a VA facility. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And I mean, one, one of the things we talk about all the time is that, you know, say you have a woman veteran who's coming out of the military, or, or has, you know, time has elapsed and she's gotten out of the military and wants to come to the VA for the very first time and she has that encounter, and that immediately right there just shuts it down. And they don't want to come back to VA for that reason. But there's so much that's it's the entree to so many benefits and services that they're entitled to. Uh, so definitely, I'm so glad to see that Secretary McDonough has been very upfront on this issue, and I have heard from his own mouth many, many times how important this is to him, so I'm, I'm grateful for his leadership. Um, one of the things that I hear from our members quite a bit, and I think this is probably one of the, the chief complaints that I've heard, and you are well familiar with this, Leela, is um, about 
reporting procedures. And I, I made a, a comment the last time we had a, a roundtable discussion with uh, Chairman Takano. It should be as easy for a VA employee to point you to the direction of the bathroom as it is for them to tell you how to report assault. This shouldn't be complicated. They should, everybody should know how to do this, and veterans should be aware and have that knowledge that if something should happen, there's a clear reporting chain. So can you tell me how VA is working to improve reporting procedures for assault and harassment? Yes. So uh, the law actually has a couple clear directions in it. One of the things that it says is that every facility will have prominent signage in our facilities designating who are the points of contact for harassment and sexual assault. So first of all, we are educating staff every day. We spend a lot of time educating staff. Um, and we, but sometimes we just don't get it right. So if, what we're trying to do is we're going to have, by the, I think October, we will have prominent signage in every November, I should say, November 15th, I think is our goal, to have permanent prominent signage in every VA facility that says who the designated points of contact are. So for Veterans Health Administration, you know, the medical centers, um, our leadership have designated the patient advocates as the points of contact. So that's to say that if I've never been into a VA medical center, like I haven't been in the Tampa VA, I'm not familiar with the VA facility physically here, if I walk in there and I've been harassed, then I'll know, I'll see prominent signs and they'll tell me to either go to the VA police or go to the patient advocate. There's, most people know to go to the patient advocate, even in a civilian hospital, people go to the patient advocate, so they know that's a good point of contact. I want you to know, though, that the patient advocate should not be the only place that you go. If you go to your primary care provider, you can go to a women veterans program manager, you know, we are really working hard to educate staff so they will know where to send you to, but what we're saying is, is if all of that fails, the patient advocates are going to be trained to make sure that the veteran who experiences harassment, veteran visitor, volunteer, caregiver who experiences harassment in a VA facility will know what to do. We have developed training. The, the training will be rolled out this year so they'll know what to do because, you know, that's, this is a new space for them to handle harassment complaints. But they handle complaints all the time, so they are great at handling complaints. So um, that, is, that is the one thing that we're going to do, or that we're doing. The other thing we're doing is, We'll be happy to take some questions afterwards if we could. Um... I, I can't stand here that long. And a lot of what you say is very good, but one very simple thing should happen. Staff in all the clinics, when they're new hires or the old hires, should be trained when they look in the eye of the veteran and you put your card down there and they look you again and say, okay, where's the veteran? Go get him. You can just check in. That happens over and over and over. No, you are absolutely right. We are at If you implement that little thing by training those people before they go behind that counter, you may have a much better experience when a veteran comes in there. Say that's I am working with any harassment advocates 
sexual assault, but I will tell you, I know Dr. Patty Hayes, the Chief of Women's Health, that has been a priority for her a long time. And I know that there are working groups right now, the Women's Modernization Work Groups, that are diligently working on educating staff. Because you, you just made a very good point, a 20-year-old. So that means that 20-year-old uh, person is uninformed. You know, they just don't know. But that's why we have to continually educate staff. There's so many things going on. Thank you, thank you for that. So I want to just say one, one other quick thing to the point that you've made. Um, one of the things that VA recently has done is we've sort of subtly, the women's, women's uh, Center of Women Veterans, some of them are here today, you may have even talked with some of them, um, they have signs now in every VA medical center that says, I am not invisible. And you see women veterans pictures because sometimes it's just ignorance, they just don't know. They may just know that they're, I didn't even know. When I joined the Marine Corps, the only veteran I knew was my World War II father. I didn't know any of the veterans. And so sometimes it's really just not knowing. So now every VA medical center has images of women veterans in their medical centers. So now you can see faces that are women. So that, that's one more soul way. you are 
the medical center and let's say that you you know harassed and you just you know you're on your way to your appointment you just don't have time to deal with it you know you leave and you go home you know and then you're at home and you're like man that just was not right I, I you know that didn't sit well with me and now I'm home I don't want to go all the way back 20 miles back to the VA to tell somebody how do I tell them and so what we're really working on is an electronic way for people to submit their complaint online that is our our goal. So hopefully this time next year I'll we'll invite it back. I'll be able to talk about that because that is something that's very important. People should be inconvenienced. We want people to go just like you can go to the OIG. To the OIG right now you can do that. You can go to the the OIG's website and report a complaint. We would like for you to be able to go to our website and, and submit a complaint if that happens to you. We don't want it to ever happen. We really want everyone to feel safe in every VA medical center. But in the event that it does happen, we want you to be able to. Well, we look forward to those updates, Leila. I'm sure I will be in touch. Okay. We'll allow us to, yeah, hopefully learn more soon. Are you ready for the pledge? I would love to do pledge. Are you all ready for the pledge? Yes. All right. Let's get it. We do have ribbons outside, so you'll get a ribbon. And, we, and these are metal ribbons. We do have them outside. And we also have a little card because I'm saying this here, this, you have a lot of information you're taking in today, but we want you to remember the pledge. It's one very simple uh, sentence. But if, for those of you who would be willing, I would love for you to take the pledge along with me. If you'd stand and just raise your right hand, that would be pretty awesome. And I have the, we have the pledge on the uh, screen as well. So I, state your name. Pledge to never
You have to understand that. You cannot think that you are going to go out there and be just as competitive. We have to talk to the entire family. So let's drill down. Maybe I just went a little too fast here. Let's drill down to things that we should know. These are VBA benefits. You know how to get them. You know how to get to us. You know people need to be connected to them. Whether they are currently serving in the military, or whether they have just begun to think about transitioning. So what have we been doing? I've already talked to you a little bit about outreach. 56 regional offices, collaborating with VHA. But I wanted to share with you some of the data. Now it looks good, lots of numbers, but you should know during COVID, we pivoted virtually and began to talk to our veterans electronically and to process claims electronically. We haven't missed a beat in processing claims. You know what we've missed a beat on? Getting people to exams. That's where we've missed a beat. We're actually running around, you know, figuring out what are people going to do while we're trying to get people to go to their exam. That's my first ask. Help us. We've worked to make sure the environment is safe. You've already heard Layla talk about what we're doing as far as the um, Deborah Sampson Act, you can choose, select your agenda of your provider if you are an MST survivor. But the first step is knowing you got to get to that exam. So we've been putting the word out and we've been making sure that people know. You see that number up there for events just help for women. How do I know this? Because I'm the one that puts the statistics together, and I'm the one that makes the regional offices report on what they're doing, and I'm the one that's reporting that. So we know we can do more. Yeah, this is how we're doing with women, connecting to those benefits. Great statistics, but again, when you consider that we are at anywhere from 15 to 18% of the military, the current military, you can still see that we are grossly underrepresented in getting connected to benefits. Because not everybody can be as hefty as I am to point out to people, I am the veteran. And we have to speak for those people also. So, your second call to action is speak for those that you know don't like confrontation. Me, I'm a little shy when it comes to confrontation. If you can't, you can't. I heard that. All right, so public laws. Uh, we did um, do a study on our coordinators that are in the regional offices. And we do have some work to do. They are not full-time positions like they are uh, of their counterparts in hospitals. We're gonna have to do some things there to make sure that they have the time and the tools. That second piece there speaks to a program that we developed for transitioning women Actually, our sister organization, VHA, developed the program and packaged it up for VBA to deliver in the transition space. But there are great things for all women there, and why did we do that? You know, I've had to sit at the table with a lot of current DOD people saying, you know what, one fight, one enemy, one organization. And I had to remind people, everybody is not going to be comfortable talking about their body in front of men like I am. So we have to have an environment where it's just transitioning women who can talk about their needs. 
Because if you want to sit down with me and talk anything, we're on. Everybody is not suited to do that. So we had to create something for women to have that environment. So there's been a lot from education. You know, most of us have been around, because I've been with the VA for 26 years, we all know that Vogue Rehab used to be the Cadillac program. That was the program that you got your housing, you went to school, you got tested, you did everything. Education service came on and said, oh no, I think we can do some things, Congress. You give us this, you give us that. Now when you start looking at everything in the forever GI Bill, there's no way anybody can say, I don't want to do this. There's something there to get everyone going. If you want to start your business, fine. You want to go to two-year, fine. You want to do trade school, fine. You want, to, you want to do it, it's there. And we have got to get that word out to people. So, that was almost 10 minutes. I did tell Ashley, she said, hey, uh, we don't have time for questions. Um, you want to stick around? So before I came to headquarters, because I'm not a headquarters buddy, I've only been there for five years. I was in the field doing regional office director stuff. So with that said, if you have some questions, I did tell Ashley, stick me in a corner somewhere over here, and we'll get you some answers, or we'll get you some questions. I may even ask y'all some questions. Like what y'all been doing? And then we'll have a dialogue and we'll keep connecting. So, Stephen, I, I'm gonna test something up here. I, I had people call me saying, Are you good? I'm like, Yeah, uh, that's fine. So, I'm, I'm gonna bring Stephen up. As I said, he was the main bill here. I was a tag along. And Stephen uh, has been working this project for a while. To set this up, you know, we knew in the VA. We had a problem with reaching out to women, and basically because I'm always telling people, you can't build anything that, that the people don't want. You need to understand what everyone needs are. You have to ask them. And fortunately, we have a nice organization called Veterans Experience that they are renowned for doing human-centered design, going out to people and asking, what do you want? Because you know, if you ask me what I want for dinner, I will tell you. If you put food on the table and I don't have money, I may eat it. If I don't have money. But if I have money, I'm going to go get what I want. So you got to ask me. And that's what that human center design did. So we went out and we talked to veterans, normal veterans, normal women veterans, normal men veterans, and asked them about their experiences in the realm of working through women, veterans, and counties. And Stephen has been working this project for the last 18 months, and it's truly my pleasure to bring him up here to talk to you about the results of that journey map we put together. So, all right, Stephen. And so I understand when things are said, are you the veteran? I 
understand it because my wife is a veteran. I have to turn and say, no, my wife is a veteran. Talk with her. Because she is the one that has served this country just as you have. So I thank all of you for your service. I truly do. So, as Director Rawls said, my name is Stephen Ellis, and I'm a Senior Customer Experience Strategist. And I want to talk to you just a little bit about a project that we've been working on and some of the things that have come out of it. We have developed this Women's Veterans Journal, and it's talking about women just as yourself and helping us to understand you're going for your VA benefit. journey map, five women for veteran personas, insight, uh, insight report, which gave us five different insights, and eight key findings. Some of the key takeaways that came out of it, as Director Rawls said, we use human-centered design as a methodology that we work with this. We're sharing these insights with the Women Veterans Program from VHA to VBA. We're also sharing things with our partners at DOD and we're working with them and the Red of Rawls team. Okay. We're gonna enhance that outreach We're looking at programs specifically directed for women veterans. Stand by. <laughs> Matt doesn't play well with this thing for some reason. I apologize for my, my use of Apple. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Director Hall says she did that. It gave us a chance to talk to women veterans because we know this population is growing. And so as I stated, the approach we use was human-centered design methodology. And what is human-centered design? It's the framework for problem solving. It builds those solutions and it gives the human perspective of talking to each and every individual. And it's going to, it helps us to understand the veteran's experience. So again, like I said, as you can see here, and I know it's very small because my eyesight is hurting, but trust me, we will, it's going to be up on our sites. We have our journey map, those personas, and the insight report. Now, as the director Ross said, this was uh, an 18-month um, endeavor that we, that we came through. And so we started out, and we were going to be doing our interviews in person. But as you all know, that has affected, COVID affected us all. And so we had to change how we were going to do this. And with doing this, we had to move to a virtual environment, as we've had to with everything nowadays. And so we didn't lose anything or nothing changed, but we gained even more. So we interviewed a total of 76 veterans through this process. 64 were women, but we also interviewed 12 men because we want an overall perspective of men and women. This is a women's veterans journey now, but we know some of our men can, can give a perspective of how they have seen women treated throughout their service. So, a journey map. What's the purpose of a journey map? 
Journey maps are a customer-centric approach to evaluate the path of what we're trying to see. And I know you can't see it here, but with a journey map, I like to say there are bright spots and pain points, right? And so bright spots that they're annotated on there, they are, they are sunshine, rays of sunshine, right? But again, remember I said we have pain points also. And pain points are those lightning bolts that you see. And that's where we're looking at to find out where are those pain points? What are people, what are our veterans experiencing? What are our women veterans experiencing for those pain points? Because at VBA, we want to make sure everyone is inclusive. Not only VBA, VHA, VA as a whole, we're looking, we want to make sure we do that. So with that, there are some moments that matter. Right? And, I, and I'm, I'm going to touch on just a couple of them here. So a, a bright spot that came out was joining the service. A woman veteran said. She said joining the service. And, and a, a direct quote was, I was looked up to as a leader. I had a responsibility and I would think no one could understand that. That's all of you, right? You've been looked up to as leaders in, in, the, in the military. And that was a bright spot that came out of that for this veteran that we spoke with. <clears throat> but again, like I said, we talk about pain points, and those are those lightning bolts. Those are those things that we want to find that are going to stand out. So another moment that's on this journey map is Trans transitioning out of the military, choosing or having to leave. And so the pain point that, that came out of this was leaving because of harassment and discrimination in a male-dominated field. And, and so what came out of that is that men are resistant to following orders from a woman in that position. And the veteran said, I probably would have never left if that was the case. And you heard Layla talk about that and how we look at this. And so this is something that we are working to change. And we're hearing it firsthand. And this is coming out in our, in our interviews with our veterans. And so as you all just took that pledge, this is something that, we, that is beneficial for us all. We all can work together with this. Another, another bright spot that came out for us was growing and finding a purpose, focusing on what I am. And, and so the quote that came from that veteran says, at first I was on the fence about going into a different field. But they came in and they talked to a vocational counselor. And that counselor gave them some ideas, and they helped them to find a different perspective. That's beneficial. That's VBA and VA working for the veteran. That's VA and VBA working for you. Because we know if you are in a field that's going to benefit you, it's going to make you a happier person. It's going to give you a happier life, and it's going to transition out for you and your family. But again, like I said, it's not all about the bright spots. Those pain points are the things that we're looking for. Another pain point that came out was gaining stability. And the veteran stated, relocating for my loved ones, and she said, not realizing I was eligible for a VA home. I didn't even realize I could buy a home. That's a problem. That's an issue that we have to take on. Because we have to get your benefits out there and help you to understand what your benefits about. This veteran is saying, I didn't know I could buy a home. We should not, a veteran should not come out of saying, come out of the service saying that. When they, go, when they come out, they should know everything that's entitled to them. 
And so that's what we're working here to be able to do. That's what we're working here and Director Rawls and her outreach team. Those are the things they're getting out. We're working in different facets to get this information out and to make sure you know it. Whether it's through TAP, whether it's you're going into a regional office, whether you're going into the hospital, it's part of our I care model. Integrity, commitment, advocacy, respect, and excellence. All. That is what we are about, and that's what we're trying to stand for. So like I said, that's just a, that's just a brief synopsis of the journey. We also have personas, and persona profiles are very big. Persona profiles are fictional characters. They are interview, interviews that we actually had that we gain that information from, rather I should say, and we, and we put it together to develop a persona. And as Director Rawls said, you will be able to see some of these personas within yourself. As you look to your left or as you look to your right, or people that you work with or that you serve with, you will be able to understand and see some of these personas. And I won't go through all the personas, but I, I will touch on just a couple of them because they're very beneficial for us. <clears throat> so as you can see, we have well off Wanda, advocate, advocate Anita, and moving on to mine. So let's start with well off Wanda. After a full and fulfilling career, as a high-ranking service member, Wanda retired from the military life and is proud to be a veteran. Although she did not experience any discrimination, she saw it. Since she's retired, Wanda has went on to lead a very successful civilian career. We all know Wanda. Wanda is there. I can introduce you to a person that is identified with Wanda right now. And as I look here, I have Director Rawls. She is, she direct, she is the person that, that identifies with well off Wanda. <laughs> but we, we know that we know these things, right? We all know those, those people that have been able to persevere and have great careers throughout the military and come out and get those and have great civilian careers also. But Wanda is not the only person. Like I said, advocate Anita. During Anita's military career, Anita achieved success and was promoted into leadership, but was forced to leave because of a medical emergency, medical discharge sooner than she wanted to. That's someone we know also. It's our coworker, it's our friend, it's our neighbor. Our personas are based upon, again, fictional characters, but these were, how these were developed were part of the 74 interviews that we did. And so, again, as we look at these personas, these are individuals that we can identify with. I want to talk about one more person with you. And that's untrusting Uma. Uma entered the military. She had high hopes to retire someday after a long, successful career. But instead was medically discharged after being injured. Throughout her time in the military, Uma faced traumatic Okay, a traumatic moment, rather, I should say. She had traumatic moments that were based upon abuse and a mistreatment. Again, ladies and gentlemen, we know these personas. We know these people. These are individuals that we talk to on a daily basis. And so when we have these people that we come in contact with, we want to make sure we get them directed to the appropriate service. You heard 
um, Layla talking about the Deborah Sampson Act and different things of that nature. These are things that are taking place that are going to benefit untrusting Uma, but also hesitant hiding, well off wander, moving on May. These are, these are situations and these are things that are going to happen and that are going to be in place for everyone. All of our veterans are going to be better off for this. So as I stated, we had some insights and some key findings. <clears throat> Excuse me. And insights, they are based on the decisions. While, while all women veterans, I should say, may not experience every insight, every insight represents a major pattern that was heard in our interview sessions. Insights are written in direct language. They are universal truths. So when we are sitting in those interviews and we're talking to those veterans, these are their words. And this is what we're hearing from them. So an insight that came out were, was connecting to other veterans with similar backgrounds. Women veterans feel more comfortable connecting with women veterans that are like them. I don't, I don't want to bypass that at all. Again, women veterans are more comfortable with veterans that are like them. A quote, direct quote that came out earlier, ideally women veterans could not talk by the total place where, where they feel veterans are visible and are able to easily connect with other people or veterans themselves, right? So when we, go to, when we go to those women clinics, it's about women. It's not about men and women. It's about women. And so making that connection is very important. Another insight that came out was hiding trauma to remain strong. That, that's a strong, that's a very strong insight. During their time in the military, women veterans learn how to be independent and strong, which enhanced their attention to detail and ability to get through stressful situations. Women veterans shouldn't have to hide their trauma. That shouldn't happen. That should not be the case. But in our interviews, this was an insight that came out that was very important. Because yes, you're being strong, and yes, you're being tough, but you shouldn't have to hide that based upon anything. Women veterans, they ask because they want an empathetic ear. They want that listening board to be able to talk to. And so it's important that we have that for them. Again, some key findings that came out of this. Being an employee means being part of a veteran community. Again, in our interviews, we did interview some VA employees. And so they said working as a VA employee provides access to a unique veteran community that, that eases the line of transition because of similar situations. I will say, working at the VA and working with my counterparts and my colleagues that are there, they have, they have a sisterhood or brotherhood that I am, that I don't, that I am not part of. And I respect that. Because again, as I said, I have a veteran every day that I'm, that I'm supporting at work and also at home. And so I understand and I've been talking with her and seeing the things that she talks about, knowing the things she talks about, it gives me some understanding of what goes on. But again, I can't sit in her shoes. 
because I did, I did not serve. Another key finding was facing discrimination behind, beyond gender. While, when, while, while many women face bias in the military for their gender, for some dealing with discrimination for their race and sexual orientation is an additional burden. We know this is, we know this is out there and we're looking to change this. And when our women veterans are serving, their, serving this country, they should not feel any different than their male counterparts. But we're not gonna gloss over that and say that it does not happen. We know that it happens. But we have the opportunity and the chance to make a difference with this. And so again, as, as Layla gave the, the pledge up here, Let's start there from, from our perspective. And let's build that culture. Because discrimination, sexual or any kind, should not be tolerated. And we should all stand for it. So we need your help. It's all about engagement communication, and continuous feedback. Engaging when you're in your offices with those veterans and talking with them, keeping them engaged. I know this happens with DAV because as I worked in the regional office, DAV, the DAV office was always there and always talking to their veterans and keeping things going. But the engagement is going to start with our outreach programs, as Director Ross spoke about. We're definitely going to be a part of this, and we want you a part of this, because this is a collaborative effort, and it's a team that's going to work together with this. Communication. Making sure that we are communicating what's going on. We hear things, we know things, let's share these things. Let's make sure everyone is up on what we're talking about. Again, like I said, it's part of that eye care aspect of the VA, and it's a, and we buy into it. And last but not least, your continuous feedback. We want your feedback. We want to hear from you. Director Ross, as she said, if, she, if Ashley has to put her over there in the corner, she's going to take questions. But she's also going to give some questions and, and throw some things out there too. And I'll be sitting by her side, but she won't let me go nowhere. <laughs> but I'll take I'll be taking questions with her. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for your time today. I, again, I want to thank you for inviting me to speak at your national conference. And again, I want to thank all of you for your service.
talking about our VA loan that's addressed to him. I'm like, wait a second. You know, I get it. I get it. But we want to be validated for our service. We want to hear that validation. And I think to get it directly from the VA is, is fantastic. I think they're doing a great job. There's work to do. There's always going to be work to do. But I, I truly appreciate everything that all of you are doing to make that happen. So thank you all. Um, and I think we've gotten some marching orders here too, right? We're all going to go back home to a different place. We are spread out across all 50 states. I've met a couple of people here from Hawaii. I don't know why they're coming here. We should go in there, right? Yeah. I don't know what, the 2024 DAV convention. Can we get that in front of the We need to take all this information, all this knowledge back home to them, make sure that they understand what VA is able to do for them, make sure that we're getting them connected to people that they need to get connected with, with their veterans' benefits, with their veterans' health care, um, and that we're standing up for ourselves and for others. As Ms. Rawls said, sometimes we know people that aren't going to stand up for themselves and we have an obligation and a duty to do that as well. We all want to see 